Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Ellis. I'm the executive director of Wild Care. Wild Care is located in East Ham and we are a wildlife rehabilitation center. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, baby rabbits and what to do if you find a rabbit nest in your backyard. I first have a few slides about Wild Care, who we are and what we do. So we are a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to treat sick, injured and orphaned wildlife for release back into the wild. We do a lot of public outreach and education such as programs like this and try to encourage people to coexist with wildlife. We treat over 1800 animals per year and I have a wonderful staff of eight and over 150 dedicated volunteers. We could not do the work that we do without our volunteers. Uh, so we provide education and outreach. We have volunteer and internship opportunities, and we do provide our own uh, veterinary and rehabilitative care on site. We have a consulting veterinarian. And I had to include this photo of this beautiful five day old um, orphaned rabbit. The rabbit was caught by a dog and the finder could not locate the nest, but I just had to share because this rabbit has the most beautiful blaze, really big, a white, unusual blaze on this cottontail's face. So Wild Care also operates an emergency helpline. And this is a, a phone line where people can call us 365 days per year and ask us questions. If you find an animal in distress or if you have a human wildlife conflict, we can help with that. So I feel really proud to share that we received over 10,000 phone calls to this hotline in 2021. And that number alone shows the significance, the importance of the work that we do. Where is our facility? Our facility is located on Cape Cod and we are conveniently located on the Orleans Rotary on the East Ham side. And so we're located about here on the map and you can see that uh, Cape Cod here being on the outer Cape, we are surrounded by ocean. We're about 30 miles out to sea. And so we receive aquatic birds throughout the year. What animals do we see at Wild Care and why? Well, we get animals for three main reasons. They're either orphaned, injured, or diseased. And we primarily see wild birds. Over 70% of the animals we receive are wild birds. We also treat wild reptiles, wild amphibians, and small mammals. The largest mammal we can accommodate at Wild Care is the Virginia opossum. And here are some quick stats that are important. In 2021, we, we received 1,812 animals. And of importance, over 70% of these animals were impacted negatively by people. And that's either directly or indirectly. And that's an important number as we go through this presentation today. There's a theme um, that wildlife is, um, you know, they're doing the best they can, but often people get in the way. So um, there are many times where we, can intervene and help, and there are some situations where um, we do not need to intervene. And before I start my discussion on rabbits, I just want to share that um, I am super grateful to live and work on Cape Cod and to live in New England in general, because we are blessed to be in a place that is so rich in biodiversity. We have animals in the air, the land, and the sea, and um, just a beautiful place to be with lots of people who appreciate it. So on to the Eastern Cottontail. Um, I love Eastern Cottontails. They're such a beautiful, beautiful animal. And what many people don't know is that they are not a native rabbit to Massachusetts. Eastern Cottontails were actually introduced uh, to Massachusetts beginning in 1895. They were introduced from um, the lower Midwest states. They were first introduced to Nantucket and then across Massachusetts. And then further in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, Division of Fisheries and Game, they started a captive propagation, a captive breeding program, and they were stocking rabbits in Massachusetts for hunting purposes. And so now we have um, an abundance of rabbits on Cape Cod because they do breed like rabbits. And so they've absolutely um, flourished, excuse me. And so Cape Cod hosts the highest concentrations of Eastern cottontail in the state of Massachusetts, which is really incredible. I love to share that. So Eastern cottontail or New England cottontail. 
we do have a native rabbit in Massachusetts. It's our New England cottontail. And so who's who? Well, it's really, really difficult to tell, even if you have rabbits in your hand. So here on the left is um, supposedly an Eastern cottontail, and here on the right is supposedly a New England cottontail. And you can see there's not much of a difference. There are a few characteristics um, that differentiate, differentiate them. So the New England cottontail typically has a darker back, a broad black stripe over the, the edge of the ear, and a black spot between the ears. The Eastern cottontail typically has a paler coat, a rusty neck, a narrow dark margin on the front edge of the tip of the ear, and typically a white spot or a white blaze on the forehead. And um, researchers tell me that you can't discern them in the fields. The only way they can truly be um, differentiated is through uh, genetic testing of their feces, or what we call sculling, um, looking at the skulls of deceased animals. But there are some differences in habitat. So Eastern cottontails, this is the abbreviation, excuse me, Eco is Eastern cottontail and Nico is New England cottontail. So Eastern cottontails are abundant everywhere in Massachusetts, more so than any other mammal that we have here in the state. Eastern cottontails thrive in all sorts of habitats. So shrub, thicket, residential, backyards, middle of lawns, isolated weedy patches, gardens, you name it, they're around. Whereas the New England cottontail have a more specific habitat preference. They prefer young forest and shrubland. And as you all know, on Cape Cod, we don't have as many of those young forests. And so New England cottontail, um, because of uh, fragmentation and degradation of habitat, they have been declining. They're being introduced in some locations in Massachusetts to help aid in species recovery. Um, if you see a rabbit feeding out in the open in the middle of your backyard, 99% chance that it is an Eastern cottontail because the New England cottontails really want to stick to that cover where they can um, hide and escape. Another quick note on New England cottontail, they've been confirmed in several counties in Massachusetts and uh, WildCare actually works with Mass Wildlife. Their rabbit biologist is Dave Scarpiti. He's a great guy. And um, the rabbits that we get that don't survive, we provide him with the carcasses and they then look at uh, the, the craniums of those animals to determine if they are New England cottontails. And this provides them with information about um, the, you know, the abundance of New England cottontails on Cape Cod. They don't have a lot of data from the outer Cape in particular. And so as much as we want all of our rabbits to live, the rabbits that don't survive are also put to good use because they go to this population study. So a few facts about the Eastern cottontail before we talk about their nests. So first of all, they are not a rodent. Uh, they are what's referred to as a lagomorph. And the lagomorphs include uh, the rabbits, the hares, and the pikas. And what sets them apart from rodents is that lagomorphs actually have two sets of top incisors. So they basically have, they have incisors in the front and then just behind another set of incisors in the upper palate. And when you think about that, then they are herbivores, they are eating machines, right? Um, they can just chow things down in seconds, including your flower beds and your vegetable gardens. Um, so very efficient upper incisors. Rodents, on the other hand, have the top incisors and the bottom incisors. They are typically a solitary animals, though you may see four or five in your, in your yard, um, especially later in the season when there are young that are dispersing. They're typically silent, but they do communicate softly amongst one another, and they do thump. So thumping generally is to alert the others to predators, and um, <laughs> Bambi was legit. I think there was a rabbit named Thumper. Also, if you've ever had the misfortune of hearing a rabbit get uh, seized by something, they have a blood curdling scream. Uh, it is not a nice sound to hear. And um, how do rabbits defend themselves? Well, they're super fast, as you know, they're powered up by those hind, amazing hind legs. They can jump, they kick, they scratch, and they do bite. So we have to be careful when we handle them. 
They also have a spine that um, severs very easily, which is to facilitate, since they're such a prey item, it facilitates a swift death when they are grabbed. So as a rehabber, we have to be very careful handling them, support their front end and their back end at all times. It's a, they're a very important um, prey item for many different species of animals. Uh, you know, the, the carnivores eat them. So the foxes, the coyotes, but also the owls, um, the hawks. And typically life is hard if you're a cottontail. Um, everything eats you and you're always on the run. And so typically rabbits live less than a month in the wild, high mortality, especially for those young animals. They can live, however, up to two years in the wild. They are active year round, they do not hibernate. Typically they stay in less than one and a half acres. That's their territory. Um, in the winter months, if it, the weather's harsh and food is scarce, they will move, they will expand beyond those territories. They like to use natural and man-made dwellings to escape from predators. So under your sheds, behind your wheelbarrows, they will take advantage of those. And Mr. McGregor asked, what don't they eat? Well, they are opportunistic herbivores and they eat everything. They eat grass, bark, twigs, buds, fruits, flowers. They prefer the tender shoots. They love clover, dandelion. They'll eat your prized tulips your ornamental trees. They love your vegetable gardens and their favorites in your garden include lettuce, beans, beets. They'll eat strawberries, blackberries. They eat everything. They also engage in um, their what we call uh, coprophagic, which means that in the evening they produce these softer green feces and they swallow those feces and then it goes through the digestive process, bacteria breaks it down, and they actually can derive more nutrients from that food that had already been passed. It's believed that this is an adaptation um, for these animals who live their life on the run. If you're eating and you're interrupted that evening, you can eat your feces and derive further nutrients. It's brilliant, really. I'm glad that people don't do it, but it's brilliant. So the Eastern cottontail, I'm telling you that they're everywhere, right? They're so abundant. So what are their threats? Their threats are many. Um, the number one reason we receive adult cottontails is due to vehicle strikes. Um, the number one reason we receive orphan cottontails is nest disturbance by dogs, cats, and landscapers. Um, also lawnmowers and weed whackers running over the nest. Adults and youngsters are susceptible to pesticides if they graze on vegetation that has pesticides on it, certainly loss of habitat, disease, natural predators, unnatural predators, and kidnapping by well-intentioned people who may find a nest and believe it to be orphaned when in fact it is not. The New England cottontail, what are their threats? Well, they face all those same threats, except they have additional threats. They have competition with eastern cottontail for favorable habitats. They have loss of habitat. Remember, they like those young forests. And also fragmentation of ha habitats. Um, when we create um, you know, roadways and pathways and houses, we are fragmenting a forest, um, which is needed for these animals to thrive. Also, the eastern cottontails, they breed like rabbits and they have several litters a year. Whereas uh, the New England cottontail, their breeding season is shorter and they have smaller litters and therefore they have a lower reproductive rate. And, and um, so you can imagine how with all of these um, pressures on them, you can understand why their population is not as sustainable as the eastern cottontail. So eastern cottontails at wild care. This is the number one, the highest number of a mammal that we receive at wild care every year. In 2021, we received 345 eastern cottontail rabbits. And of those rabbits, 227 of them or 65% were orphaned. And 10% of those orphans were caused by dogs getting into the nest. And we're gonna talk about what to do if your dog finds a nest of baby bunnies and how to keep your dog out of the nest. They're also the most kidnapped mammal or a nicer way to phrase that would be over rescued mammal by well-intentioned people who find baby rabbits and believe them to be orphaned when they are not. 
So what happens with rabbits is we do a lot of phone mitigation, try to keep babies in their nest unless they're truly orphaned. Um, eyes open babies stay at wild care for rehab, but all eyes closed orphans go to Christine Beebe. She's an amazing uh, licensed wildlife rehabilitator who's been working with wild care for 30 years. This is Christine's 30, 30 year anniversary um, as a wildlife rehabilitator and rehabbing rabbits. Last year, she rehabbed 184 baby bunnies. Um, she is just a godsend and she's our bunny whisperer and we love her. So breed like rabbits, do they? Yes, they absolutely do. Rab cottontails are promiscuous. They do not form a lasting pair bond. The male does not play any role in parental care. They nest from mid-February through September in the New England um, in Massachusetts. And their gestation is 30 days. Litters average uh, typically around five young, but they can have up to eight young and they can have three to five litters per season in New England. Some amazing things about rabbits, cottontails, is they are what's called induced ovulators, which means that they can release a fertile egg when they mate, um, even if they are already pregnant. Um, they have something, it's called superfetation, where cottontails actually have two horns to their uterus, so they can have two pregnancies at different stages taking place within their body at the same time. And imagine this would be a great adaptation, um, especially because you're always on the run and a lot of your nests get predated. So um, if you've just given birth and that nest is already predated and then you are already pregnant with developing rabbits, um, then that would be an advantage because you can just keep reproducing and keep trying again. It's really, really fascinating. Okay, so Eastern cottontails, where do they make their nests and what do their nests look like? Well, this is what a typical nest looks like. It's usually in grass. Um, it can be anywhere. Open areas, including backyards, um, often rabbits nest close to human dwellings. We have seen a trend in that cottontails will often nest in dog yards. And you think, oh my God, how stupid. But our theory, and this is purely anecdotal, our theory is that um, the rabbits perceive um, you know, the dog as a helper in that dogs will keep away large predators. Uh, when in fact, unfortunately, in most cases, the dog ends up being the predator um, of the nest. So it's really unfortunate, but we see this all the time. They will nest under bushes, rocky crevices, in the middle of your lawn sometimes, in flower pots, in garden beds. Nests are a simple, small depression or a scrape in the grass layered with pulled grass, leaves, rabbit droppings, sometimes a little bit of paper or a little bit of trash. And if mom is close to giving birth or already has young in the nest, there will be fur in the nest that she pulls to line the nest. This forms a soft, uh, a beautiful uh, warm layer to keep the young warm. Now, the important thing is that the mother rabbit knowing that there's such a prey animal, she does not stay at the nest. She only nurses the young, um, typically twice a day at dusk and dawn. They are a crepuscular species. They like the twilight hours. This is critically important if you find a nest, because if you find a nest, there is not going to be a mother with it. And that does not mean that they're orphan. Um, a female may reuse a nest within a given season, but the young rabbits do not return to the nest. So if you have rabbits nesting in your yard and you let them do their thing and then they, you know, they disperse and you don't want the nest anymore, you can dispose of it. She can find another place to nest. So here's what the babies look like. Um, young cottontails are, or young rabbits are referred to as kittens. And I think looking at this photo, they should be referred to as hippos because doesn't that look like a little hippo? So newborn cottontails are pink and hairless and they are two inches long when they are birthed. They weigh less than an ounce. They are naked, blind, deaf, and completely helpless, 100% dependent on the mother. They are scentless in the nest, which um, 
that's really, really important because you want to make sure if you find a nest that you're not handling the babies, we don't want to add our scent to the nest because that will attract predators. Um, sometimes, oops, excuse me. Sometimes mom might be disturbed while she's nursing and then she runs out of the nest and she might drop one of her babies on the ground. If that's the case with gloved hands, if the baby is unharmed, you can put the baby into the nest with the others and cover it back up. Um, baby bunnies mature very, very quickly. They leave the nest within two weeks and they're independent by three to four weeks old. That is a fast development in the mammal world. They reach adult size after four months and uh, females are mature within two to three months. So rabbits grow like weeds. And this is important to remember, if you have a rabbit nest in your yard and you don't want it there, give it two weeks, just two weeks, which is a small blip in time considering all the pressures these animals already have. It's um, a small act of kindness that we can do is to wait and allow them to do their thing for two weeks. So here is a five-year-old baby bunny. Uh, baby cottontail. This is the cottontail with that gorgeous blaze. And then you can see here's a two week old rabbit. So this rabbit would just be leaving the nest. It would still be nursing for mom. Um, and you can see, you know, it's furred. It's got the classic white star. Eyes are bright, alert. It's sitting upright, probably nibbling. So that's a healthy uh, two week old baby rabbit. Okay, so you found a nest of baby rabbits in your yard and there's no mom. Oh my God, it must be orphan. Well, it's probably not and don't panic. As I mentioned, mom only nurses the babies um, two to three times in the evening. So you're not going to see her. She's only spending minutes at the nest. She doesn't want to attract predators. So if you find a nest in your backyard and you want to make sure that mom is around, you can do this simple method that works. Take um, four pieces of yarn or four pieces, um, four small sticks and make a tic-tac-toe pattern across the top of the nest. So put the sticks on top of the nest, leave the nest alone. In the morning, check the nest. If the tic-tac-toe pattern has been moved, that means that mom has been there to nurse the young. If the tic-tac-toe pattern has not moved, give us a call. We might have you take some photos because sometimes we can tell just by looking at the bellies if they've been nursed. Um, but more often than not, if the tic-tac has moved, mom's been there. If the tic-tac hasn't moved, mom probably hasn't been there. And so this really, really works. And again, a simple thing that you can do, um, you can even use ribbon, because the babies sit really tight in the nest. They're not moving. They can't move um, because they would attract predators. So um, it's a really sort of foolproof test. Okay, so I found a nest of baby rabbits. Can I keep them? Well, the answer is no. In the state of Massachusetts, it is illegal to keep Eastern cottontails or New England cottontails. Rehabilitation of cottontails in Massachusetts requires a wildlife rehab license. Also, cottontails are notoriously the most difficult mammal to rehabilitate. They can die from stress and handling. They have very sensitive uh, GI tracts and gut flora and dietary needs, and they can get a gastroenteritis just from stress or mishandling or improper diet, often leading to death. Um, they also can carry zoonotic diseases that can be transferred over to you. And we're gonna talk about those in a few minutes. So really important, um, do not keep the baby rabbits. There are so many domesticated rabbits that need homes. You can contact your local shelter. So I found a nest of baby rabbits and I don't want them here. I don't want them in my yard. Can I move the nest? And never, ever, ever move a rabbit nest. Mom will not find it. As I mentioned to you before, the young are scentless in the nest. This is to avoid predation. So if you move a nest, mom is not going to find it. She doesn't know to look for it. She believes it's been predated. So the young will perish in the nest. Just remember, 
The babies will be gone within two weeks. The kindest thing you can do is wait and just enjoy the beautiful experience. You know, take a few photos of the nest. You don't have to touch them. Take a few photos of the nest every day. Share it with your grandkids. Share it on social media. Show everyone that you're doing the right thing. So young rabbits that are about four to five inches long, bright eyed, alert, um, they're out of the nest and they're the size of a tennis ball. Um, as long as they don't look injured and um, they're in appropriate, you know, exhibiting appropriate behavior, then those are babies that are independent. They're on, your, on their own. And I know you might see them and they're the size of a tennis ball and you think, my God, so small and vul vulnerable. But those babies are on their own. They don't need help. Okay, so my dog dug, dug up a nest. What do I do? I love this photo. This is Layla, um, our marketing director, Eva's dog, staring at this rabbit here and the rabbit's very alert. So if your dog digs up a nest, don't panic. There are a few things you can do. With gloved hands, check all the babies for injuries. If your cat or dog had a baby bunny in its mouth and it's injured or it's covered in saliva, it will need to go to wild care or to your closest wildlife rehabilitator. If the babies are uninjured and warm, put them back into the nest, cover it back up with all the nesting material and leave it alone. Do the tic-tac-toe method and check in the morning to make sure that mom returned. Do not handle them unless absolutely necessary. The more we get our human scent on them, the less likely it is for mom to come back. Mom's gonna certainly just sense a disturbance. Call our helpline whenever you're in doubt. If the babies are scattered about and they're not injured, but they're cold, you're going to need to warm them up. So you can put them um, into a shoebox with a, what I call a rice warmer, which is basically a sock tied at one end filled with rice, put it in the microwave for a minute, and it becomes this instant mom. It's nice and warm. You can put that in the box with the babies, glove tans, minimize scent, minimize handling, Make sure the babies don't overheat. When they are warm, they can then be placed back into their nest. You don't wanna put ice cold babies in the nest because they probably won't survive. So how do I keep my dog away from the rabbit nest in my yard? Um, well, there are actually lots of simple solutions and I have this awesome, <laughs> I hope you enjoy this video that we put together yesterday. I'm gonna play this for you. If you find a rabbit nest in your backyard, and you have dogs, don't panic. There are simple things you can do to keep your dog out of the nest. So here's our nest of baby rabbits. And every time you need to let your dog out to go to the bathroom, you can take a laundry basket or a milk crate and put it over the nest, put a brick or a piece of wood or something heavy on it so that it can't move. Then your dog can do its duty. And then when your dog goes back in the house, don't forget to remove the basket. If your dog is really nosy, won't leave the basket alone, you can take um, this garden fencing that we found at Agway. I don't know if you can see it. You can see that it has holes that are large enough for mom rabbit to get through. Um, but if you have a small dog or a large dog, they're not going to be able to get through this. You can buy much higher fencing also in case you have a giant dog. And so you just want to make sure you put the fencing all the way around. So again, well, this will help keep little dogs out, but larger dogs, you will need a higher fence. And so this will keep the dogs away from the nest temporarily. Um, don't forget to remove the basket once you go back in the house with your dog. And um, you can leave the fencing there because mom can get through. Mom's never far behind. I hope that you all enjoyed that beautiful video. <laughs> so the fencing will need to be much higher and we didn't purchase a lot of fencing for this demo, but it is best to give a wider parameter. Um, you know, this fence was right around the little nest. Give a wider parameter and um, a taller fence if you have a bigger dog. So another thing you can do is for two weeks, you can always um, have your dog on a leash in your backyard while it goes to the bathroom until the rabbits disperse. 
And you can also use a milk crate, a laundry basket, put a brick on top so your dog doesn't knock it over. But it's really important. Don't forget to uncover that nest once your dog's back inside. And the rabbit fencing, that can stay up, you know, that can stay up for weeks because mom can fit through, as you can see here. Um, another thing that is great and will also keep cats out is cinder blocks. So put cinder blocks in a square around the nest, piece of plywood on top, and mother rabbit can fit through those cinder block spaces, whereas your dog and most cats cannot. I think that's brilliant actually and not easily moved because cinder blocks are heavy. Um, some people use take a wheel barrel, put it over the nest, it will be at a tilt, elevate it with a cinder block. That is brilliant and protects the rabbits from the elements and your dog can't fit in there. If a nest is flooded and we get calls, you know, the month of May, especially on Cape Cod, it rains every day. We get calls about baby rabbits that are just, just flooded, washed out. And so what we recommend is that you wear, um, put on gloves. You can take your shoe box and your heated rice sock, dry the babies, get them warm. When they are warm, dry up the nest with simply with paper towels, um, put the nest back together. Um, put them back in it when they're warm, cover them back up, and use the tic-tac-toe method uh, to make sure that oh mom has come back. Oops. If you find it, use the tic-tac-toe method, leave the nest overnight, and check the tic-tac-toe in the morning to help you determine if mom has returned overnight. So my dog ate rabbit poop. Now what? Well, for some reason, rabbit poop is really yummy to dogs. You also might have a dog who finds a baby rabbit nest and eats a baby rabbit. Um, this is disturbing, yes, for all of us. Um, fortunately, it does not pose a serious concern for your dog. If you have any questions, um, you can certainly contact your vet. If your dog vomits, refuses to eat or drink, or has any change in behavior after eating rabbit poop or eating a baby rabbit, absolutely contact your vet without hesitation. Um, there is not a high risk, but there are some uh, things that your pet can pick up from rabbits from eating their feces or eating their babies. That includes intestinal parasites like tapeworm, tularemia, which is rodent and rabbit fever, which is carried by bacteria from ticks that is transmissible to dogs and to people. And also, of course, fleas and ticks. Rabbits are ground dwelling creatures. Um, they often are loaded in ticks and they can have fleas and that can be transferred to your dog. So I don't want you to think about rabbits as these little pathogens in your backyard. Um, they, are, they are not, but certainly if your dog is eating their poop or eating their baby rabbits, um, you know, these are just concerns that you should consider. Okay, so the nest of baby rabbits that you found, you've determined they truly are orphaned, or you've found babies that are injured, unstable on their feet, exhibiting inappropriate behavior. Say you have a baby bunny that's just laying in the grass and gasping, that's not normal. If, they, if baby rabbits in their nest or out of their nest are covered in flies, that is not normal. These types of babies should be transported to a local wildlife rehabilitator. And so again, gloved hands avoid excessive handling. You want the babies to be warm, so provide a supplemental heat source. When you're transporting, it should be in something like a shoe box that is dark with some ventilation holes. Darkness, quiet is critically important. Again, remember these babies can stress just from, um, they can die just from stress. So heat source, do not give food or water that can cause more harm than good. You can aspirate a baby by giving them fluids um, improperly. And also they have, rabbits have a very sensitive GI system. No food or water, avoid talking, avoid playing with the rabbits, avoid playing music during transport. Quiet, darkness, and also put some of their nest in the shoe box with them. That will be a familiar smell and a place where they can hide that will be comforting to them. So how can you help rabbits? Uh, well, there are so many ways that you can help them. Uh, for one, um, keep your children and pets from nests. If you find a nest, it's fun to observe from a distance. And nowadays, a lot of us have trail cams or security cams where we can set up 
cameras on a nest and watch remotely without even harming or disturbing the animals. That's a really fun thing to do with your children. Do not handle babies or nests. You can take dogs on leashed walks to prevent them from getting into nests. Keeping your cat indoors is the safest thing for the cat and the safest thing for, the, for our wildlife. Um, build a catio. If your cat really wants to be in the great outdoors, you can build an indoor outdoor patio for your cat. So they will be contained, but they still think they're in the great outdoors. Check before you mow. Every year we get baby rabbits, um, box turtles that have been run over by lawnmowers. You all have seen now how inconspicuous the rabbit nest is. I mean, literally a little scrape in the ground that will, might look like dried grass. Um, please check your yard before you mow so you don't mow over baby rabbit nest. Check your brush piles and fire pits before burning. Every single year, we do get baby rabbits that have been burned in brush pile fires. So a simple check, move the sticks around, check under the um, parameter of the brush pile and look under, make sure you don't have baby birds, baby rabbits, um, turtles, foxes, you name it, nesting in the brush pile before you burn it. And don't use pesticides. These animals are grazing on all of this vegetation. And so if you're using pesticides on the vegetation in your yard, you are impacting the rabbits. Oops, and I have this slide. So this is Lucky. I have a little video here. So Lucky was found last year. Lucky was in a fire pit and someone lit the fire pit and then noticed that there was a baby rabbit in the pit. And so thank God they acted really quickly and they took a shovel and they flung the baby out of the fire pit. So fortunately, this little baby was not burned, but uh, he did suffer a front broken leg. So we bandaged the rabbit's leg at Wild Care. And then the rabbit went into rehab with Christine, our awesome bunny rehabber, mm -hmm. and survived and was later released. You can see him chomping down here on kale and lettuce. So this was a really lucky rabbit. It doesn't always go that way. Um, unfortunately, you know, many rabbits that are in fire pits or brush piles that are burned uh, suffer um, really terrible burns. So you're probably saying, I love rabbits, but they eat all my plants. They're eating all my flowers. And they're eating all my vegetables. So what can I do? Well, first, if I had a great answer for that question, I would be a billionaire. I think that is like the billion dollar question. <laughs> um, there's no clean answer. Um, if you have vegetation that is um, nipped with clean edges, and this can be, uh, you know, trees, vegetable garden, clean edges is usually rabbits. And so what you can do is you can use rabbit uh, fencing, which is any wire fencing that has small openings, openings that rabbits can't fit through. It must be at least 18 inches high. Rabbits can't hop over 18 inches and they're not great climbers with those giant back legs. And so um, a high wire fencing around your plants will do it. There is a new product called Plant Skid and it is a, an animal-based product Rabbits are herbivores, and so they do not eat um, animal matter. This is, you know, a humane and organic product, and supposedly it works. There are also recipes. Again, it's um, animal-based, so eggs, milk, water, and spray that on the plants, and supposedly rabbits don't like it. And then you can spread dried blood fertilizer onto your flower beds or veggie gardens to deter rabbits. Oops. Another thing you can do is soak paper towels in white vinegar and place these paper towels on the border of your garden. Refresh, have a vinegar spray bottle where you can refresh those towels every day. Remove your brush piles and debris where rabbits might hide or nest. Now you can discourage them from doing so. And protect your shrubs and small trees with a quarter inch mesh, again, higher than 18 inches. Okay, so how can you help us help rabbits at Wild Care? Well, we work with Christine and she takes all of our um, eyes closed bunnies 
And I wrote down 174 baby cottontails last year, but I think it was 184 that she received in rehab. And she has a really great success rate. So we try to support her in any way we can. And so Christine needs donations of newspaper, pillowcases. Um, she goes through tons and tons of veggies. In fact, she said that these babies here on the left, munching down on kale, they would go through three or four heads of kale a day. And that's just for a group of five bunnies. And they don't just get kale, they're getting all sorts of things. And she does um, pick things like dandelion and clover, but believe it or not, it's difficult to uh, find, well, especially now vegetation isn't out yet, um, you know, the dandelion and the clover, um, but also we have to be concerned when we pick things in the wild about pesticides. We have to make sure there's no pesticides on them. So Christine buys a lot of her greens at Capabilities, Whole Foods, and Shaw's. We would love, if you're willing to donate any of these items, please drop them off at Wildcare between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. any day and label them for Christine or for the bunny lady. And we will make sure that we get them to her. Look at those little babies. So these were babies getting close to release and, and Christine released them. And so I hope that you learned a lot about rabbits. I hope it inspired you to recognize that we can all make a positive difference for wildlife, one animal at a time, and with, often with just simple actions. Um, and I feel really good about that, knowing that even our small actions make a difference. If you have any questions, you are welcome to email me, stephanie at wildcarecapecod.org. If you have questions for Christine, you can also email me and I'm happy to pass those along. And I just want to thank Christine for her incredible 30 years of rabbit rehab and wildlife rehab in general. And also I need to thank David Scarpiti. He is the wildlife biologist, the rabbit guy at Mass Wildlife and um, he had provided me with the New England cottontail information that is in this presentation. Oops, I have a very slip, slippery mouse that keeps advancing the slides. So I hope you all enjoyed it. And now you know what to do if you find a rabbit nest in your backyard. So go out there and enjoy. Have a great spring and summer.